Thank you, Jesus. Let's just stand, change the position. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come once again before thy throne of grace, Lord, let this time as we look into your word, Lord, use this vessel of faith as you would see fit. But Lord, we look towards you from whence cometh our help. For I ask this now in that precious name that is above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated this morning. Get my tie on straight because somebody might ask the question why it's not. We, I'd rather have my revelation straight than my tie on straight. Praise the Lord. This morning, it's not a deep thing that for a thought that came, but there are things in God's Word that would help if we look at it right, settle certain questions. And sometimes a word in the Bible means a lot. And that word, depending on how you use it, can bring different thought areas in which you're looking at things. And the word this morning is the word after, A-F-T-E-R. After can be something precise if that's the intention you want to give it. After can be relative any time after. If somebody says, well, why don't you come to supper any time after six, six o'clock because they want to make it for six o'clock or to be there around that time. Well, you can't take that word after and stretch it in the natural realm. Don't go to that house at midnight. That's a long time after. I think the supper would be cold. So you have to look at it in a certain relative terms how the word is applied. There are three examples that I want to bring out this morning that's related to time. And two of them actually show that the word after means right after. At that time. In the immediate time frame, shall I do. And the first one, if we want to go to Jeremiah, Chapter 29. This is one of the verse which I want to look at that word called after.
I'll start reading from the seventh verse. Here the Lord is speaking through Jeremiah. It's concerning the 70 years that they were brought into captivity by the first beast or world empire that the Bible describes. In the Bible, there is four great empires which relates that affects mankind concerning the Jews and believers. The first empire that the Bible has relation to is the Babylonian Empire. Then there's the Media Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. As Daniel has seen it, as John sees it in the book of Revelation, that fourth empire, which was the Roman Empire, would run till the consummation, till Jesus would come. Well, some say, well, where is it today? It's how you look at the scripture. Because when you read that fourth beast or that fourth empire, the Roman Empire, the beast that was, was not, and yet is going to be. What has transpired in that one? The beast that was, secular history has recorded how, that, how Rome was established, the head of that Roman Empire, there were Caesars sitting on those thrones, ruling the empire. But when it came to about year 400 to 490 AD, after Christ, Attila the Hun, pretty well done in that Roman Empire, as far as its political, its military aspect of having an empire. It fell by the wayside, and history no longer records the Roman Empire. But the Bible don't look at things just in a secular point of view. It looks at it in the terms of how God looks at it as how he affects the soul of men. The beast that was, from the time in the beginning, whichever year you want to pick, to the B.C., till you hit Caesar, till Jesus is on the scene, and until about 490, when Attila the Hun destroys it, the, the, the fragment of that empire. Now, what has happened? There was a major changeover around 490. There was a pope living in Rome. And as Attila the Hun had swept all over Asia, the Middle East, and was coming towards Europe and then was going to come down towards Italy, he goes with his bishops and without an army and goes before Attila the Hun. And he tells them about Attila the Hun about the God that he served and that he should spare Rome. And here he is without an army. There was no army that could stand up to Attila the Hun at that hour. Here he is going without an army. He goes there and he gets favor with Attila the Hun. Attila the Hun didn't kill him, but he goes back to Rome, having the land of Italy saved, from that invasion that would really devastate the whole thing. That brought the papacy, that papal office, for not just being in the religious aspect along in the Roman Empire, now the Roman Empire goes down, and now this pope is ascended in the eyes of the people as being something great. He has saved us. And from that hour on, then the, Roman, the, the existing territory that was the Roman Empire, little by little graduated to being Christianized under the Catholic Church. And that's where he began to have its power. Now that's the beast that was not. No, history doesn't record how the papacy was that empire. 
But then at the end, in the hours and the days that we live in, we're seeing the reviving of that last empire, the Roman Empire, as it's being built up. No, it ain't going to be like it was in the days of Caesar. But it, what is an empire? It's nations, people, adjoining their feelings and their support to one common cause or goal, like being a country. And so is Europe has done it. But right now we don't see the body of that Roman Empire, which is the Middle East, because what's hindering it is that Muslim belief right now. But one of these days when that miraculous war takes place, that's just ahead of us, where God's going to intervene, they will be changed. And then the body of the beast be ready to be joined to the head. But that's, I'm getting off track to where I want to look at this morning. So that first empire, which is the Babylonian Empire, as you can see on the map behind me, the Babylonian Empire was an empire that destroyed the Assyrian Empire that preceded it. There's other empires in history, if you want to look at them, but they were not significant concerning how God was looking at it that would affect the Jews. So now as we see the Babylonian Empire, its rise to power was in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. But what caused God to allow an empire like the Babylonian Empire to rise up in such a way that it destroyed the nation of Israel? Destroyed it in the sense they took and went and took captivity all the Jews that was in the land, destroyed the temple, carted off these Jews to Babylon, which is near the Euphrates rivers, not too far where the Americans are fighting their war today in Iraq. What caused this situation to transpire? Then we have to go back in, in history Just after King David, about 490 years before they were, the Jews were captive, brought captive by the Babylonian Empire, the Jews did not obey God, did not really walk with God as they should have or ought to. And you can read the histories of different ones, what they've done. But one thing God, he picks out of his word. And he says, because you have not let the land rest every Sabbath, every seven years. Then for every Sabbath, as we're going to read in Jeremiah, God now takes and he says, I'm going to send you in captivity for 70 years. Remember the Jews, the outlook of the promise on the descendant of Jacob. They, God said that wherever they would go, they would prosper. That means that in their makeup, they're into business. They like to make money. They get into everything. And the Jews for 490 years from the time till about 605 or 606 B.C. Now why do I say 605, 606, or 604? Because dates are not all that accurate, but we're looking at events. So at that time, these Jews, because they were greedy, they didn't want to give the land rest. It's almost like the spirit that's in this Gentile world today. We used to have, most people used to have Sundays off for a day of rest to have the freedom to worship the Lord. Now it's not that God sees every day the light. And don't get that wrong. It's not Sunday so special that, but God said to rest on seven day. Work out six and rest on the seventh. Your body needs it. 
I know this because I remember when I was younger working in a factory. They would have what's called shutdowns and they it'd be a big panic till everything would be repaired. And it was go, go, go till it's actually started up again. And sometimes you'd go two, three weeks. Sometimes I've even sometimes seen a month. And the company would want you to work 20, well, not 24-7, but seven days a week, keep on going. But I found through my own experience, once you pass the seventh day, your potential that you had in the week before now is reduced by 30%. And then if you go another week without a day of rest, then it's down another 30% until you're almost like a place like a zombie. You're working, but you're not much beneficial. And the company should have realized maybe a day's rest, they would have got more in the long run than pushing everybody to work every day till that project was, was back up and running again. So it is true that man needs his rest. All right. Now, as the Jews has misused the land, God's using this as a picture. Yes, they did other things during those 490 years leading up to the dispersion of the Jews for the first time out of the land of Israel. But God is speaking about the Sabbath and the land needed rest. And he says, I've raised up my servant Nebuchadnezzar. Now people read that, oh, he, he's a saint. No, he's not. Servant in the sense, he's a servant in God's hand for God's purpose. That don't mean Nebuchadnezzar believed God and was a worshiper of the God of Jehovah. But now as we arrive in when Babylon came in to take Israel, it did it in three stages. They didn't take everybody away the first time. The first time when they came, it took away the ten northern tribes, most of them. Then there was a second attempt, a second time they came into the land, the Babylonian Empire came into the land of Israel. Again, more destruction took place. Finally, the third time, they came in, destroyed the city and destroyed the temple, and the temple laid in ruins. Now since the temple and, that, and those Sabbaths, that's where the Jews would come and worship on the Sabbath day. And God was giving a ran, uh, the land's going to have a rest for everything. Because if you go on the internet or if you look at different commentaries, some of them look at it from an intellectual standpoint. They say the 70 years began here. They're looking at it when the people were taken away. Some say, no, it was from the first, when the 10 tribes, the first of Asian came in, that's when it was. Some say the second, some say the third. There's got to be something to settle it all out. All right, so in verse 7, as we go in here. And seek the peace of the city whether I cause you to be carried away captive and pray unto the Lord, for it is in the peace thereof ye shall have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets or your diviners be in the midst of you to deceive you, neither hearken to your dreamers, which are, ye have caused to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto, my, unto you in my name. I have not sent them, said the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that's after, now that's that word, after 70 years be accomplished, at Babylon I will visit you and perform my good works towards you in causing you to return to this place. So God is saying, after 70 years, 
He would cause the Jews to return back to the land. In our minds, we think this is all the Jews. But it's not just pointing to the return of the Jews. It's pointing to the temple in Jerusalem. It was destroyed around 586 B.C., And if you take 586 B.C. to about the time to 536, the Jews were to be under the bondage, if you want to, or the captivity of the empire, the Babylonian empire. And as we know, that Babylonian empire came to an end almost overnight. Belshazzar was there having a, an orgy of drinking, drunkenness, and everything that was taking place. And the media Persian, or the, the Persians, came and took the country in one quick, quick sweep. Then Cyrus, being on the scene in the first year of his reign, what allowed him to inspire him or to, to be in favor as Daniel would speak to him, that they would, he wrote a letter that the Jews could go back and rebuild the temple. Why the temple? Not to, lay, to put the land and everything else. It was to build the temple. So from the time that the temple was destroyed till the time the reconstruction started, not when the temple was finished, them going back was exactly 70 years. And so he says, after 70 years, they would return, but return to build Jerusalem, the temple. So the word after didn't mean, well, it's 70, maybe, uh, oh, it might be in 76 years, or, or after, after 70, sometimes after 70. It might have been 87 years or something like that after. No, it's after, right there. Actually, there's one, I don't know if I put it up here or not. It talks about here from, it must have got this from history, from the Battle of Cardinamish on May, June 605 B.C., Daniel's taken captivity after this battle. So that's the Jewish first year of captivity. But then that by the fall if you want to, of the end of the Jewish year, that began 606, by this time, Daniel was being carried away to Babylon. But the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C., which is right here. And when they were 70 years exactly, Cyrus made a decree that they, a certain amount of Jews went back to build the temple, which was 70 years exact to the point. It ended exactly on the Feast of Tabernacle in Jerusalem, fulfilling the full 70 years not 71, not, not 86. So the word after is precise. And when we look at it, the word after, in respect to God measuring time, when he's using it to measure time, when he says after, then it is right after. Because we're also going to see another example where it is right after. The, why am I going down this? We're looking at Hosea 6 and 2. After two days, you're in the third day. Well, after two days, when is the revival taking place? They don't have a clue. But somewhere, something's going to be right. All right. In verse 10, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good works my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. Where? Jerusalem. What for? Building the temple. All right. Now, if we go to Jeremiah, Jeremiah prophesied this, sorry, in chapter 25, verse 12, concerning that how they would be brought into captivity now. Now, 
Verse 11, so, yeah. And Jeremiah 25 says, And the whole land shall be desolate and at an astonishment that these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. There's other things that goes along with this. When Babylon, when God said he raised up Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, as his servant, because he was going to punish Israel, it was conditional for other nations too. If they would take the yoke under Babylon, God said those nations would be uh, spared of major devastation. But those that would refuse, they would be put to the sword and they too would fall ill to the armies of Babylon. So this was a warning to Israel and to the other nations that were around in Israel at that time. Now I want to go to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 9. It is Daniel that's writing. The prophetic event determines either a beginning date or an end date. We can't use our mathematical carnal mind to determine things just by numbers alone. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, And in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Now we read that desolation of Jerusalem. Oh, the destroying of the city. But it's, it's looking at its center of that city, Jerusalem, which is the temple. That's the desolation spoken about that Daniel is speaking about here. And it would be that, that we're the 70 years that God is looking at. Because some said, well, some historians look at it, well, those 70 years is, we try to figure it out how long they were in captivity. Yes, they were in captivity. But the whole point, God was looking at Jerusalem, the place of worship. Yes, they were in captivity in, in Babylon. But God was looking at the time, the 70 years, he was implying it to that temple, which was the center of Jerusalem that was in desolation. It got destroyed in 586 till the time 70 years ran out. And then a small number of Jews had now gone back to build what? The whole land? No, the temple. And that was under Hezekiah and Ezra. You'll find that in there. You'll find it in Chronicles as well concerning how the, they, would, they were to go back and God would cause them to build that temple. I wonder if I could uh, ask someone to get a glass of water. Yes. When you talk too much, you get thirsty. I wouldn't know that. All right. So this is one instance that the word after is precise. It is related to in the revelation of it, God marking time. Now you can use the word after in other thoughts or other things, after this period or after that, that's open-ended. But when God's putting a specific time, the word after is specific. All right, now I'm going to go through this second example, which we're more familiar with. And that's in Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Here's Daniel. Why was God holding him up so high? God used him. Was it because he lived more righteously than 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Daniel had favor with the word of God, not just in living it, but knowing what God is wanting to do. And because Daniel was a prophet, which was concerned of what God's plan is for his day and things coming future, God dispatches an angel to him, the archangel Gabriel. Now that's something. Not too many have seen Gabriel. So as these seven years were coming to a term, Gabriel comes to Daniel. And as Gabriel is coming, he's hindered. And this is where the picture brings in the Archangel Michael. It shows his work as the defender of the nation of Israel. He's dedicated to that nation and that nation only. And in the spirit world, there's a war taking place. Even today, there's war in the heavenly realm. Satan comes and he's the accuser of the brethren. But now we're looking in the times of Daniel. Around 536, 38, whatever the case may be, around that period of time. He's seeking an answer from God. And then when Gabriel finally arrives, he says, I was hindered three weeks, but Michael the archangel was there to fight against that spirit of the prince of Persia that was hindering the message to get to the man. And you would think, God is all powerful. He's everywhere, present, nowhere absent. It wouldn't take him three microseconds to get an answer to Daniel. But God allows all this to be recorded to show the interaction between the angelic family and the family of man for your and my benefits. Because how many have how many has peered and seen what the spirit world looks like? You may have had a vision, but it is recorded God's word in such a way that we can relate to it to see what's taking place. So now as the word comes, Gabriel brings the message to Daniel. And he was looking more information, if you want to, in one sense about the 70 weeks. But Gabriel comes in and says, Daniel, I'm just putting in my own words. In verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish the transgressions and to make ends of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting and righteousness and to seal up the visions and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. He shown Daniel is sorry, uh, Daniel has been shown by Gabriel the archangel there would be seventy weeks. It's not for a novice reading this the first time, 70 weeks. Oh, well, that's uh, about less than a year. Uh, a little bit more than a year. Because 52 weeks in a year, right? You better get it right there. But what God means by the word weak, we have come to an understanding. The word weak is not seven days. That's how we measure time today. A week is seven days. You work for your week, and then you start to work again the next week. But the word week, as we find it in, in Genesis, it means a multiplier, number seven of something. It can be seven days, seven hours, or seven years, or seven millennium if you want to. The week just means number seven of. We attribute days to that week. But God's definition of weeks, as we see it in Genesis, it means seven 
years, seven times seven years, which is a multiple of seven, of seven year period, which is 490 years in time. You and I know that today. I don't know if Daniel knew it in his day. But it is there in the scripture. We have been made to understand it in our day. Now as he's finished describing what all these 70 weeks are to accomplish. And to anoint the most holy. That would put Jesus in the millennium. Well from the time Daniel is looking at this. And that prophecy is to start, and started in 445 B.C. God started it. Oh, maybe I got it here. It started in 445 B.C. when they were actually sent. And they were let out of Babylon. That's all the people going back to, to Jerusalem. From 45 BC till you hit where Jesus Christ would actually come and die on the cross of Calvary, you had 69 of those seven year periods, which is a total of 483 years, would transpire till Jesus would come. All right? That shouldn't be too complicated. We're not going to go into the other part to calculate the days when he was born and so forth. But now, Gabriel is telling Daniel, and in verse 25 is how you read it. Knowing there, understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. In other words, seven plus 62 means 69 weeks. The street shall be built again and the walls even in troublesome time. And it was when they did come to that 69th week. Now watch. And here's that word again. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. Now if after can be relative, well, Jesus could have died there. Could have been, well, maybe it might have been 42, 50. Uh, could have been any time. We, we could stretch it wherever we want. It's After. Exactly, 69 weeks. That's the 7 plus the 62 makes 69 weeks. Jesus was crucified exactly 69 prophetic weeks from the time of that commandment going forth. So the word after is exact. Because then when we look on here a little further down as we read it, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince, which is the people from Rome, shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And, they, and unto the end, war, desolation are determined. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease and the overspreading of the abomination shall he make it desolate until the consummation or the end and that determined, it, that determined shall be poured upon the desolate what is it saying it's saying Daniel's 70 of those prophetic years, of weeks of years, when 70 has gone by, you will be in your millennium. You'll anoint the most holy. 
And if we try to figure things out with our carnal mind, well, okay. Our generation, we know how to count. And if you, well, yes and no. I know my generation, you had to learn your multiplication, your divisions, and everything, and so forth. But today, if the computer goes down, they can't do a thing, can't calculate anymore. They need the little calculator to do the calculation. We get lazy. Your memory goes, whatever the case may be. But as we're looking at that time frame, if we were Gentiles, like Gentiles like to think, in a logical mind, in a, a carnal mind of, of deductions, week one, week two, week 50, 68, 69, all 70s right after. God didn't tell them they would all run one after the other to the end. Only a mind would assume such things. But when it says after 69 or 62 plus 7 that the Messiah would be cut off, it cut off that nation. It cut off because remember the prophecy is to the nation of Israel, not to an individual. And so the time clock when Jesus was crucified, God stopped the clock of counting weeks. But now the Jews are no longer going to be into the land because they're, now they've been cut off because of the Messiah, spiritually speaking, and they were physically cut off in 69 AD or 70 AD when Titus came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And they've been cut off ever since till the time that fourth beast that we're talking about, the Roman beast, when it is revived again and its signs a covenant with the nation of Israel in her full land, all the tribes being there, then that time clock will now start for that last prophetic week to take place. That's what we're looking at. The bride in this hour is like Daniel. That's why we are concerned about what God is wanting to do in our day. Yes, we need to live right. And don't never diminish that part. But if you don't know the hour you're living in, you'll never hear those thunders which is to calf off the bride. And if you don't come into acquaintance with when those thunders do sound, you're not going into rapture. You're going in that week of Daniel. I don't care how holy you live. Because God's concerned for the word today, knowing where you're living at, because someone has concern for today and the time you're living at, is because there's a hunger wanting to know he that created you and me and what he wants to do. Because when we say, oh, we don't need the book of Revelation, we don't need to understand all these things, you might as well tell God to his face, I don't care about your plan. Just save me. But his plan is he wants to save a people and to instill a, a knowledge and a revelation of what his plan is. Somebody's got to carry it. Well, praise the Lord. So after 69 week, not 69 and a quarter, not 72, that after means right after. How many understand? We are looking in a similar situation right now how Daniel was looking at those 70 weeks. Daniel didn't go down with a pen and a well, an abacus calculator. Well, was it from the first uh, invasion? Was it from the second invasion? How long have we been here? He looked, at the, he looked at scriptural things that he could base his time upon. And when he looked at the destruction of the temple, until the time they, go, they would leave to go build that second temple, 
That's why Daniel in 9, chapter 9, verse 2 talks about the desolation. The desolation is not how the city looked, but the desolation is because of the temple. And when we look in Daniel here about the desolation, the abomination of desolation in chapter 20, in verse 27, it's pointing to that temple. Because when the Antichrist comes and sits in it, it's a desolation to the Jews. The temple's not there. They don't own it. Somebody else has got it or they're going to destroy it. Well, they're not going to destroy it in the millennium. I mean, in the week of Daniel. Because Jesus is going to sit in that temple when the time comes. That temple will need to be purified for seven days according to the, the uh, Leviticus requirements. But now, as we are looking at our situation parallel to Daniel now. He was diligently looking into those 70 years. He needed something to go by. And just like you and I, we need something to go by that is scriptural. If you pick one scriptural event of a yardstick, then the other end has to be exact and fulfill what it has to be. Whether you're looking at from the beginning to the end of that yardstick, or if you're looking from the end, you've got to know what the beginning is. You can't just guess one or the other. It just don't work. It brings instability. It, it puts you in, in, the, in the land of Oz. How many know what that is? Fairy tale, fairy tale land. But when we can look at a scriptural point, then we can know where. And we can look back. We can look to a certain place. Because well now if we turn to Hosea, chapter 6, Verse 2. This is pointing to our day. In chapter 6 of Hosea, verse 1, it says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. This is not to your Gentiles. This is to the Jews. When did he tore them up? Way back there in the Babylonian Empire. When he's going to heal them in our generation just up the road. When has, when has he smitten them? Back in the days of Babylon. And when is he going to heal? Who is it going to be a lot of doctors and healing program and miraculous things? He's healing a nation. A nation is not affected by cancer. But it is affected by people how they are brought together and of one mind. And in order to bring them of one mind, something God has to do something. Now he says in verse 2, and this is the controversy. After two days. This after is not an arbitrary word in this case. Because God's using it with a measuring stick. As he did in Jeremiah. As he's done it in Daniel. And he's doing it with Hosea. Because this word after means after. Right there. The thing is, there's been a lot of speculation. What are the two days? But the only scripture that you can point to after two days, he will revive us. That puts you in the beginning of the week of Daniel. So therefore, those two days has to run up to that where that week begins. That is a scriptural, thus saith the Lord, position 
where that is going to start. Now the question is, but those two days. And I know the brother Jackson used 33 AD. But it can't be. Because if you're using secular time, we have gone beyond the after. Then your after is a relative term which can be ambiguous to any time. Which puts you into limbo in the land of Oz. But if God's using a ministering stick, he's not going to put us in the land of Oz in fairy tales. It's going to be after. So the two days will end when that week begins here. That we know for surety. Yes, that time could have been when that apostle was looking at it back in the 90s. It could have been at that point in time, 2004 and a half. But bride has to wake up now. We are beyond it. We're almost five years beyond it. If it was a week or two, or a month or two, I wouldn't see no problem with that, because we might not have had the exact times. But now, we have gone five years. So what are those two days pertaining to? One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Some try to change it as being, no it is. Don't use is and as, it's the same way. That's concerning days of your millennium, I'm sorry, of dispensation as God would look at those days going down through. How come not much is mentioned about the Jewish calendar? They haven't reached year two, six, at the end of 6,000 yet. So are you in seventh day with the Jews? They tell you go fly a kite. Now I don't mean to be speaking here as if I am a know-it-all, but sometimes you have to express something to jar people's mind. You got to look at something. There's got to be some reality. It's not just oh we got these here together. No, oh, yeah, that's what it is. If if that revival of the Jews is going to happen. I'm expecting to see two prophets on the scene. I'm expecting to see miracles of the order of Moses and Elijah on the scene. I haven't seen those things yet. And neither have you. So now after two days he will revive us. And in the third day he will rise us up. In the third day. Now some say, oh well it could be we're in the third day, somewhere, uh, we don't know, it could be 10, 20, 50, uh, somewhere's in there. Well, why put a prophecy if it's just somewhere's in there? It's ridiculous. In the third day, when it comes. That's God's encounter of the time. Now, I'm going to say something this morning. And I'm not saying it's a revelation. But if I was to look at the scripture in the light of what is transpiring today, in 2009, we know when the week will begin. In the sense of the event that triggers it. then if we know the event that triggers that week, then you've got to look, if we're looking at secular time as doing the calculation part, if that is the way God wants to do it, or we're looking at it in that terms, if you're looking at 2,000 prophetic years down backwards, now the only thing that could be looked at that would be reasonable I'm not saying this is a revelation, but I'm looking at it. I'm looking at something. It's when the Gentile church started. And that leaves about the right number of years left. 
to fulfill the miraculous war, the Ezekiel 38 war, and to have that week Daniel come. Because remember, when God's finished with us Gentiles, what happens when the bride goes up? He's dealing with the Jews. They're in the revival. He's not going to revive them and revive us at the same time. We have our revival, it ends, then the Jews have their revival. That angel of Revelation chapter 10 is with the Gentiles before the week begins. And when we go up in the rapture, that angel that is in dealing with us Gentile in Revelation chapter 10, he goes to the Jews. And it is an angelic being. And when you read Revelation chapter 22, and if some of it's in the hearing of this message, that when Daniel went to bow down to that angel, in 22, that angel said, don't do it. And he goes on to say, That's 22, I believe, around 19. Then said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant. The angel saying, He's a fellow servant. He's a ministering angel to the heirs, actually to the ministry. And to thy brethren, John, Jews, which are Jews, the prophets, and them which keep the saying of this book. This angel that John is a, was going to bow down and worship to, saying, John, don't do it. I am an angelic ministering spirit. I minister to your Old Testament prophets. And those that keep the saying of this book, New Testament and Old. This angel is more or less is, is depicting and saying, I have ministered to your prophets. About what? How flowery it is in heaven? No! About the end time. Who is the angel showing? Daniel. Some obscure angel? It was Gabriel. That ties it together. And it is Gabriel. If he says, he didn't say, I just came to one of your Old Testament prophets. Prophets, plural. I can see it came to Hosea. It came to Daniel. It came to Jeremiah. And it came to Ezekiel. All these were pointing things about the future of the end time. Oh, son, you say something like that. Oh, who do you think you are? What are you trying to make yourself? I'm looking at the scripture and how I want to see it. How the Lord has brought these things together. What gives you the right? Who do you think you are? Nobody. But if it fits, let's go on. If you have eyes to see, ears to hear, Truth will, be, will fit. It, it's not something mysterious. Oh, it's somewhere after out there. And then you ask some question. How long is the after? We don't know. It's close. Yes, after is, is a relative word when it's not used, when God's not defining time. But from what I see of these two examples, God used that word after. It meant you come to the point of that measuring stick, and it is after. It's just that men wants to play around and say some of the afters already happened. Hogwash. I don't care if I have to stand alone. Till you can show me something that's concrete, that fits the whole word of God, and you can back it up by scriptural prophetic eventments being fulfilled, then don't come preaching to me about your different ideas.
Well, you say, why are you harping on this? It's what's going on today. As, we, as I reread it in Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, there was those dreamers, those false prophets that was around saying, this is it, this is what's going to be. Stick around. God's going to prove your little figuring and your little ideas. Because when the event comes then to be fulfilled, someone will have to apologize. Someone has to maybe repent. I'm not saying I'm right on everything. And what I just said about those days, if it goes back to when the Gentile church stayed, started, it's something I'm looking to. I'm not saying to, to, the, to the Moncton here this morning, that's the revelation. But it's looking that way. So don't take a saying, oh, he said, thus says the Lord, that's what it is. No. But I'm looking at something. And by looking at the nearness of the time, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to shout. But sometimes you need to, we need that wake up call. Oh, praise the Lord. You still happy? Amen. Nobody's mad this morning? Good. Praise the Lord. There's nothing like good hard work to relieve your mind of thinking of different things. I know the last couple of weeks, It does, does the mind good. You need, you need a rest from if, you, if your mind's occupied with a whole bunch of stuff. You get yourself in a pick and shovel work for a while. I'll guarantee you some of those things will disappear. You'll think more about the sweat on your brow, the soreness in your muscles. You may be tired physically, but your mind is at rest. Praise the Lord. Uh, that's much as I want to say for that this morning. But I'm thankful for truth. God's word is moving on. No, there ain't going to be no major things be brought forth. But little nuggets here and there. God will allow us to see. And it will fit so comfortably and precisely together. Um, I wish someone else would be sounding the horn too. I know Brother Governor is. Him and I see eye to eye. And I'm thankful. But sometimes, who who'd you go to talk to? Someone said, well, we're not sure. I'm kind of looking at it. Could it be? It might be like this, and we think, and we got to study it. If we got an honest heart, and if we're looking at it right, if God puts something in your bosom, don't be scared to preach it. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Then you've got to make it right. And that brings me to maybe in closing. There are some that have gone astray in the ministry. What is the word to the Laodicean church age? As many as I love, I rebuke. Repent. So if I've gone on off on the wrong revelation, before things can be accepted, there has to be a repentance. If it's something I've done quietly, I don't have to announce it to the bride. If it's something I said publicly, then it has to be publicly made right. And the Bible talks about, show me fruits worthy of repentance. Not saying, well, I was wrong and then everything should be okay. No, there's got to be fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, it's like trust. It's not because you read the word trust. Trust is something that has to be earned. It's a process you've got to go through. So is it when we make a mistake. There's got to be a process to reestablish that trust again. First, it's repentance, fruits worthy of, of repentance. Then there has to be that walk bringing into a place showing that you are willing to walk in that way. 
It's not because you want to sneak into a crowd and, oh, I'm sorry, and then want to be around a fellowship, and then, then you start all over again, starting with some crazy ideas. That won't work in the bride in this hour. There's nothing wrong with saying a mistake. In fact, I would respect a brother that would say, I made a mistake. It's not going to take him down a notch. Oh, oh well, we can't trust him anymore. No, I see he's got a right heart. But someone that says, well, no. But I, 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 well, why don't you accept me? Come the right way. I know some of you are new, and some of these things may be like out in left field to you. But if you are patient, what God has shown in this hour, you and I are going to see things develop. And it would clear up the wrong revelations and establish the right ones. When that miraculous war hits and God established Israel in her full biblical land as it was given to Abraham according to the Genesis, and God said he would do wonders or miraculous manners as he did in the days of Moses. God has to intervene. Nobody can settle that Middle East situation now. It'll never get settled. But when God gets involved with it, He's got a way of settling things. And I'm, I thought this last night when I was looking at this, I said, oh, uh, maybe i got 15 minutes to preach. Here I am on overtime. I better stop. You never know. You have to be depending on the Lord. He's the one that will supply the needs. Yours and mine alike. And I'm longing that the Spirit of God will start moving, putting a hunger for those nine spiritual gifts. Not manufacturing them, but an honest desire. Lord, use me. It's not just the preachers that's going to do everything here in the end time. We need prophecy. We need healing. We need wisdom. We need knowledge. We need all these things. And it's... Well, if you want to give them all to me, that's fine. But I'd rather share. I'd rather has, I want to be ministered to as well. Well, I'm going to... Yes, it could turn into a two-hour. I better shut it off now. Let's just stand as the musicians to come. Lord, once again, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and a time, Lord, to look at your words. Use the words that were spoken, Lord, as you would see fit. For I ask it now in your precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes.